stand before you tonight in my red star chiffon evening gown. What people love is the smack of firm government. And whether it was real or just an impression, people felt that Margaret Thatcher gave them the smack of firm government. Nevertheless, nevertheless, never mind, it's wet outside. I expect they wanted to come in. I can't blame them, it's always better where the Tories are. <laughs> She was the Prime Minister who really did root out socialism from the system. Let Labour's Orwellian nightmare of the left be the spur for us to dedicate with a new urgency our every ounce of energy and moral strength to rebuild the fortunes of this free nation. I suppose in a way one could say that Margaret Thatcher and Winston Churchill were the two luckiest Prime Ministers in the 20th century because they both had to face a huge problem. And the country, in each case, had no doubt that it was in the last chance saloon. And Margaret was able, and Winston was able, to take tough decisions. My face softly made up and my fair hair gently waved. <laughs> Prime Minister, leader, oh, you might hate her, but you really felt she knew what she was doing. The Iron Lady of the Western World. <laughs> From the beginning, Margaret Thatcher was someone who stood out from the crowd. At first, she stood out from the crowd in a rather annoying way. There was something rather strident about her. There was something about her voice that actually grated on you a little. There was something about her that seemed just a little bit too keen. But there was always something special about her. She has been interested in politics really all her life. See, her father was interested in local politics. Uh, always on the council, mayor of Grantham. It was part of her, the air she breathed. I think she was determined to be a member of parliament from a very early day. It was a rather dull family in a rather dull Lincolnshire town with a rather dull father who really made it through the ranks of local politics. Margaret Thatcher had heroes both personal and professional, if I can put it that way. A personal hero was undoubtedly her father. He was the um, name of Roberts. Um, he was a local politician. Uh, he, he wasn't a very wealthy man. He ran a shop. Uh, but he was a very, um, what's the right way to put it, a very upright man, a man of um, very decided views about what was right and what was wrong. There were very old-fashioned values, but ones which, in her book, stood the test of time. I remember once she said to me when we were having a chat uh, and talking about those values, she said, Michael, a man has no greater duty than to put a roof over his family's head and to put food upon the table. That was because she couldn't stand people who basically relied on benefits. But notice that she always, when she talked about these, said it was a man who did it. It, it was an old-fashioned view of life, but one which she thought held the key uh, to how political happiness could come about, political success, uh, individual happiness could come about. Her father taught her how to lead. She watched how he was the one who was prepared to go for it. And it's interesting that she hardly ever referred to her mother. It was always her father. Her father was the idol. Her father was the one, obviously, who encouraged her to get to the local grammar school, to work hard. And forever afterwards, she acknowledged the fact that she learnt her basic values at her father's knee. The older end of the school, during the war, we did have visiting speakers frequently. They'd come and talk on all sorts of subjects, from uh, dress, from history of costume, to uh, birds and, and all sorts of things. But if it was anything to do with current events, then Margaret did show an interest, and she could always be guaranteed to get up at the end and ask penetrating questions, you know. And we, her classmates, would sort of exchange looks, oh, she's at it again, you know. 
I don't think the feeling that she was an extraordinary person came until much, much later. Um, there's the famous story about her chemistry tutor at Oxford, who was asked later about what he had thought of her time at Oxford, and he said she was a perfectly good second-class chemist. I remember her because she was, I think I'm right in saying, the first woman ever to become president of the Oxford University Conservative Association. I also belong to it, and I can see her in my mind's eye taking the chair at one of the meetings. And very impressive she was, too. Uh, her, I think, strength of character and clarity of thought came out uh, very early on, and everyone was impressed by the way she ran its affairs. She left with much more confidence and a, a greater determination to um, get into Parliament. She finally felt that she wanted to get into politics. Uh, she spent some time as a, working as a food scientist, and then she uh, had a bit of a hankling, hankering to go for law. Uh, in the end, she decided that politics was what she wanted to try and get into. And then she worked her way steadily up the progression. What's so wonderful about Margaret Thatcher is that she was a conviction politician. And so right from the beginning, from the 1950s, she conceived this idea, I'm going to go into politics to make a difference. And she bustled into the room. Almost unthinkable in Margaret Thatcher's day that you would become a woman MP unless you'd reached the age of 45 or 50 and you had a pretty forward-looking local conservative association because there was still that built-in assumption among the older people who formed the electorates in these local conservative associations that the right and proper thing was for their MP to be a man. Now, some of the uh, older conservative politicians found this a bit alarming. Some, uh, thinking that she was rather attractive, thought they could handle her, manage her, you know, attractive young filly. Uh, others thought, oh dear, she's a little bit loud, isn't she? But right from the beginning, Margaret Thatcher was a woman with convictions and with drive, and she was determined to find a seat. Mrs. Thatcher, it's always supposed to be a tremendous ordeal, maiden speech. Was it for you? Oh, very much so. I've done a good deal of other speaking, but speaking in the House of Commons is quite different. It's a unique experience. Do you think it's more difficult because you are a woman? Uh, no, I didn't notice that. It really is because of, of the quality of one's audience and the fact that most of them have had more experience at doing precisely what you are doing. There's been universal praise for your performance yesterday. Talk of the front bench. How do you feel about that? Well, I think we'll just try to be a very good backbencher first. Certainly until these two are a little older, I couldn't take on any more political responsibilities. These responsibilities are quite enough. If you had Margaret Thatcher sitting now where I am and were asking her about these questions of bringing up the children and, and that kind of... She would say something like, well, I just got on with it. I just got on with it. Uh, almost, she would say to you, I don't really understand why you're asking the question. Plenty of women get on with it, and I did. That was her attitude. Carolyn Mark, if you say, have they missed out on anything? Because I lived at home, I was always there, could be there when wanted, and saw a lot of them. It wouldn't in private have been exactly what had happened. It was obviously extremely difficult, particularly, of course, um, they were twins. But uh, part of the persona that she built was that, don't fuss about these things. You know, you've got two children, you just get on with it. Have you been able to combine your political life with looking after a family, running a home? Well, I mainly do the catering here. I like cooking and I do the shopping and always a big batch of cooking at the weekend. And of course, there are the parliamentary recesses which coincide with the school holidays. So I can see quite a good bit of the children and take them out. And at half term, they come up to the House of Commons and have lunch with me. It is difficult for a female politician and because I mean even today Theresa May says things like people always talk about her shoes but Margaret Thatcher always had to have her head, hair done she always had to decide what she was going to wear people would always look at what she was wearing as much as listening to what she was saying there was always that extra problem which frankly doesn't happen with a male politician at all but it does happen with a female politician but what's it going to mean in your home life obviously you're going to have to make some adjustments 
I think it's going to mean even more organization and method. I'm a great believer in those two things. But in any case, I could never do it were it not for the fact that my home is within 35, distance, 35 minutes of Westminster. Yes. I have an excellent nanny housekeeper, which helps immensely. But I see the children every morning, and they're at school all day, and of course I make a point of seeing and being with them at weekends. People had spotted early that she had real talent. Once she got elected as an MP, um, she was made a junior minister within two years. And uh, to become a junior minister two years after you've been elected, particularly as you're, if you're a woman, said that uh, the whips particularly had obviously spotted uh, that here was someone uh, that was different and ought to be encouraged. In the debate on taxation, councils varied, but taxes down was the common theme. And there was repeated applause from Mrs. Margaret Thatcher, a front bench spokesman on economic matters. Without incentives, she said, the wealth is never created to distribute. If you run all the budgets in a race called the high taxation stakes, I am glad to say that conservative budgets don't come in any of the first four places. The topmost prize for increased taxation would go to Hugh Gateskill in 1951. The second prize for increased taxation would go to Callaghan in 1966. The third prize to Callaghan in 1965. The fourth prize to Callaghan in 1964. This chap Callaghan must go. Having been uh, made a minister so soon, then the Conservatives went into opposition, and then she worked her way through various shadow portfolios, and all the time she was building that expertise. And she was very lucky, I think, in finding also a husband, a man who'd been married before, a slightly older man, who was in a position to let his young wife have her head. And because she was blessed by having twins, she managed in an organized way to get having the children out of the way. She had had two children, she had her well-off husband who was indulgent of her, and she had her personal ambition. And she thrust forward. I met Dennis the night I was adopted as Conservative candidate to fight the Dartford election, uh, the 1950 election, and he was at the meeting with uh, mutual friends of ours. It was very difficult in those days to get a lift home, and there was a reception after the meeting, uh, and that would have meant I'd have missed the train, so he gave me a lift back. He's absolutely marvellous, and his support is wonderful and critical. Uh, it really is. I think it's critical for a person in this very gruelling job to have total support uh, of the kind which I received from one's family. And he's absolutely marvellous, both when we're doing the job of Prime Minister and during the campaign. He's been terrific. I think meeting and then marrying Dennis gave her, if you like, a freedom of not having to worry about where the next pound or five pounds or ten pounds was going to come from. She always said that Dennis was her rock, and she meant it. It wasn't just a nice thing to say. Dennis was always there for her. He was pretty well off. He'd had his own company, and that was bought up later by an oil company, so there was no shortage of cash. And what Margaret needed, particularly in the furtherance of her political career, Margaret got. I think whatever the job you're doing, you will have some worries. And if you just brood on them alone, they get much worse. You've got to have someone to talk to about them and someone to shake you out of yourself. Uh, and I'm just lucky in having it. Your husband, of course, Mr Thatcher, has been... By oh, he's terrific. <laughs> oh, he's terrific. He's terrific. There's any tension in the air, he can always say, to take the tension out immediately. I think we ought to think about uh, summer holidays, dear. Yeah. When we can go. Some hopes. Have you got yours? Some hopes. Well, if we have an election early, we can go on holiday in August. Yeah. If we have an election late... We won't go at all. No holiday. That's no right. Holiday. No, I'll believe well, that when I see it. Mr Thatcher, are you happy with the prospect of, of another few years' residence in Downing Street, perhaps? Reasonably. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> That's his typical understatement. He'd be just as concerned as, yes, I, obvious. Uh, as yes, I should yes, be. Yes, of um... course. She did have a wonderful quality which she sustained throughout her life, which was that of fearlessness. She was never frightened. She was a formidable character right from the beginning. She also had good looks and charm, and she wasn't frightened to use both of those.
Yes, there were obviously times when she could smile very sweetly and flutter her eyelids a little bit. But as she became more powerful, I think she realized more and more that it did her absolutely no harm when she needed to, to make the men realize that she was a perfectly attractive woman and that if it meant being nice to them and lowering her voice a little, yes, uh, she would do it. Towards the end of her time, she used to do it fairly outrageously. It was not for nothing that President Mitterrand of France said that she had the eyes of Caligula but the mouth of Marilyn Monroe. He'd spotted it, and plenty of others had spotted it too. I've always said, I think she had sex appeal, frankly. Um, she had something about her, and you could see why she could dominate a room full of men, her ministers around her. I, immediately, power, it was just there straight away. Yes, she wanted her own way a lot, but there was something about her. She was riveting personality. The early 70s and Ted Heath's four years as Prime Minister were a disaster because throughout the feeling was we're going to show the miners, and this was the first miner strike, we're going to show them and the trade unions generally who's boss. So they'd pass some very tough union legislation and then really on the back of that came the miner strike. And in the end, of course, Ted Heath was not able to show them who was boss. Particularly the country turned against them because it resulted in the three-day week. It resulted in you know, the lights going out all over the country uh, at certain times. And so she began to attract around her from a fairly early stage people who were, were of that right-wing persuasion within the Tory party, who after what they saw as the totally disastrous Ted Heath years, they began to see in her that here was someone who was about as far from Ted Heath as you could get. And if, that they, were, if they were going to swing the Tory party back to the right, or back to a rightwards direction, if you like, um, she might well be their woman. The first time I was really aware of Margaret Thatcher was when she was a very determined uh, minister for education and had quite a few dealings with her. And I met one of her very senior civil servants years afterwards who told me that uh, it was quite clear to him that Margaret Thatcher wasn't content to be an education minister. She had great ambition. of the English language. I hope that this inquiry will show whether sufficient priority is being given to these matters and whether the most effective teaching methods are being used. So she was beginning to be a, a bit of a magnet for those on the right of the party who were looking for someone, as it were, to save the Tory party from itself. And it was only when finally she decided that the Conservative Party was going in the wrong direction and that she was going to be the only one, because she looked around and she couldn't see anybody else, she was going to be the only one who could lead to a correction of the ways and to stop them all being so soft that she decided to go for it. And that was the point, I think, where she stopped being an ordinary person and started being an extraordinary person. A bare 90 minutes after her election as leader of the Conservatives, Mrs Thatcher arrived by sports car at central office, the party headquarters. But she didn't linger on the step too long and was ushered inside to meet party workers who'd stayed on to clap her and shake her hand. Before she'd arrived, many of those who greeted her had expressed their astonishment at the size of her majority in the ballot. But the old central office hands were clearly delighted at the way she packed out her news conference in a way that hasn't happened too often in the party's recent history. If she wasn't used to the attention, she didn't betray that. Mr. Airy Neve, the MP who acted as her campaign manager, was one of those who slipped back to Westminster looking more than pleased. When Mrs. Thatcher followed, she looked as though she too was well content with the day's events. 
She's become accustomed to flash bulbs and arc lights over the last days, but after one last session of posing, called a halt. Six, five, four. Pleading a need to return to the committee stage of the finance bill and to tell Mr Thatcher all about it. We now think of Margaret Thatcher as being something of a right-wing figure, but she wasn't a far right-wing figure at all, especially not in the early days, and when she became leader of the Conservative Party in her first administration was not a far-right administration at all. And she was somebody who was quite happy and ready to compromise. She was a conciliatory person. She was a very adept politician, but she gave the impression of leadership. She led from the front. She appeared to be strident and clear, while at the same time, when she needed to, compromising, trimming, moderating her views. So she had the style of a leader, but the acumen of a politician. Mrs. Yeah. Thatcher, the morning after your election, how do you feel about it now? Uh, perfectly all right, perfectly all right. There's so much to be done that one hasn't time to feel too many butterflies. Are you a little apprehensive about of this course, new job? Of course, of course. Everyone is starting a new job. How, how, is it, how has the family reacted to it? Oh, they're all right. They're taking it all in their stride. So whatever comes, they take it. When Have Margaret Thatcher did become leader of the party, I think they were taken very much by surprise. In fact, I, I, I remember that um, Lord Amory, who is a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, wrote a, wrote a letter to my aunt saying, should, should, should I be a bit scared of our new leader? But I think probably a lot of people thought that. What were they in for? You have to remember that the leader uh, who she replaced, Ted Heath, had become very, very unpopular. So there was great relief, I think, on the one side. But the other side, there was a feeling of, what have we done? Because she was pretty unknown. She had a lot of things about her that people didn't take to. She had a rather strange voice, for one thing, really sort of not an upper-class voice. She had come from rather humble origins, in fact. But she had that sort of voice, a bit like um, uh, a mistress in a school. She talked to everybody as if they were children. Well, how many hours would one have to do to get a licence on that thing which I was on? On the Abbots? Yes. You're probably about 16, 17 hours. 16, 17 hours? Some of the politicians probably were furious that this woman was ordering them about, and others, of course, who were great supporters of hers and who were very aware of her capacity and her ability and things, were, were very um, keen to support her. So I think it was always quite difficult. As soon as she was um, elected the leader of her party, she sought every possible opportunity to get out there, to go and meet the people, and quite shamelessly, photo opportunities were organised, and I covered quite a lot of them. And uh, she was determined that that way the people would get to know the sort of person she was. Having been here now for two days seeing the British forces in Germany, do you still think that Britain's defences are inadequate? I think I made my position very clear on Monday night. I said that I thought we'd already suffered enough cuts, that it's a government's job to see that the defence of the realm has a proper priority and that we must carry out our duties both to our own people and to our allies in the Atlantic Alliance. I think the press treated her rather lightly in the beginning. They called her Maggie all the time. A bit difficult to think of her as Maggie now. Then, of course, they... Uh, the expression that was used by a Russian leader of her became very popular, the Iron Lady. I'm sure she approved of that one much, much more. Well, the Russians haven't, have apparently protested at the anti-Soviet tone of your speech. Do you still think that speech was well advised? Oh, very well advised. What the speech did was to take the facts and make the facts tell a story. I must have hit the right nail on the head pretty hard to get that sort of response. The Iron Lady of the Western World came about in a very curious way. She'd spoken in the House of Commons about the need to resist the advances still of the Soviet Union. And it was picked up by an army newspaper in Moscow called the Red Star, and they dubbed her the Iron Lady of the Western World. And she was then asked about this uh, at a dinner which she gave, not long afterwards. And she was dressed up to the nines. She could put on the finery if she wanted to. And so she thought at the start it was rather a joke. I stand before you tonight in my red star chiffon evening gown. <laughs> my face softly made up and my fair hair gently waved. <laughs> the Iron Lady of the Western World. <laughs> A Cold War warrior. An 
Amazon Philistine. <clears throat> Even a Peking plotter. Yes, if that's how they wish to interpret my defense of values and freedoms fundamental to our way of life. And by they, I mean that somewhat strange alliance between the comrades of the Russian defense ministry and our own defense minister. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> They're welcome to call me what they like if they believe that we should ignore the buildup of Russian military strength. She never minded it having these labels stuck onto her. She would almost play up to it. She would see it as an advantage. Certainly it was not, in her eyes, to, uh, uh, any kind of disgrace or any kind of difficulty uh, being called the Iron Lady of the Western world, because to her, the Iron Lady of the Western world meant that she was someone who stood up for the liberties and freedoms and the style of democracy that the Western world stood for. And similarly, of course, when she started very serious campaigning in the uh, 79 election campaign and a lot of people would get out and they would shout uh, Maggie at her and later and later elections Maggie 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 out 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 she never once complained about being known as Maggie she never stood on her dignity and that kind of thing if people wanted to call her Maggie because she represented something that they wanted to bring about in the country then Maggie it would be Britain is a country of consensus politics we mostly mill around in the center ground and then every few years we realize, as an electorate, that it's time for a change. And the prime ministers we then elect are seen to be people who have broken the mold, who have broken the consensus. After governments led by people like Harold Macmillan, Ted Heath, Harold Wilson, James Callaghan, people thought, actually, the unions are out of control. It's time for a change. Along comes Margaret Thatcher, she is the embodiment of change. Now, these few men are the wreckers in our midst. They're not the mass of trade unionists, but there are a few militants who are the wreckers. And I think they do as much damage to the decent name of trade unionism as they do to our economy. They seek to use freedom in order to destroy freedom. They must not succeed. What was known in in those days as collectivism or corporatism, in other words, the state knowing best, uh, the government telling people what to do, the unions telling people what to do. Uh, this was her huge message that she wanted to change all that. And it, what was going to happen in the country was what you, the voters, want to happen. You're the ones who are going to decide. Now you must decide whether I'm right when I say that we've got to change direction. And that really struck a chord. And of course, crucially, it struck a chord in the 79 campaign and in the election with the people in the middle. At that election, they were the people who were saying, yes, I think she's talking for someone like me. I've had enough of all this. I'll go with her. How do you feel at this moment? Very excited. Very aware of the responsibilities. Her Majesty, the Queen, has asked me to form a new administration, and I have accepted. It is, of course, the greatest honour that can come to any citizen in a democracy. You have to remember that Britain had been through a very difficult period. There had been lots of strikes, uh, a feeling that the country was in decline. I think most people felt that not just people like Margaret Thatcher, but her political opponents as well. She came in determined to change all that. The first thing she said after election victory was um, she was going to bring harmony where there was discord, quoted the words of St Francis of Assisi. She realised that people were beginning to think that she was a bit imperious, a bit bossy. Uh, after all those appearances on television, when she appeared to be very much sort of in control, you know, Perhaps she just thought that I'd better make certain that people know that I'm approaching this in a, with a proper sense of humility. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. And, and of course, lowering the voice. Where there is discord, may there be harmony. Actually, you know, if you look at the photographs of the time, she was so careful about getting that right that she had it on a little card in her hand. And had she faltered, she'd have simply looked down and she'd have spotted the word, discord or harmony or whatever. She was determined to get that right and go in and 
Alan, I'm going to set about this. You know, don't worry. You know, I'm not quite the ogress that people think I am. I'm going to be a good prime minister. Now that the election is over, may we get together and strive to serve and strengthen the country of which we are so proud to be a part. Her first government was actually not as radical as we now like to think. It was actually quite consensual, quite moderate. Uh, she had lots of people known as wets in her initial cabinet. As the years went by, she became a more strident figure herself as she grew in confidence. What then stands in our way? The prospect of another winter of discontent? I suppose it might. But I prefer to believe that certain lessons have been learned from experience, that we're coming slowly, painfully, to an autumn of understanding, and I hope it will be followed by a winter of common sense. She was absolutely determined to change this country, to stop the decline, as she saw it, to break the power of the trade unions, to give Britain back some of the influence in the world that it had lost in the preceding decade of the 19th. 70s. So she had a very clear vision of what she wanted to do and she was prepared to be extremely unpopular while doing it. Each person must have his, own, his or her own style. They can't work with anyone else's. Your style is part of your whole approach. I didn't believe that the job of a prime minister was just to be chairman of a committee. It's not enough just to collect the voices. Leadership is very important in politics. I chose my way of doing it. The prime minister must choose his. You can't step into someone else's personality. You have to develop your own. She never, ever believed and said so in consensus politics. She thought that that was where Ted Heath had always gone wrong. The idea that you had to wait until you had everybody on board no, that wasn't going to be her way. Now, she had to tread very carefully. She couldn't go barging in and saying, this is what you'll do because I said it. But right from the start, she believed that if you were the leader of your party, you had to lead and that you had to do everything in your power to convince people that the position you were taking was right and bring them round. Oh, I think she's a person with um, great um, stamina, great dedication, great courage and therefore, to some extent, a crusader and, uh, if you like, somewhat gifted with tunnel vision because if you're a crusader, you've got an objective and you go for it. I admire her energy and I admire her determination, but she suffers, I think, even in those particulars, from what Proust called the certainty of the second rate. I don't admire her intellectual method, which is an incapacity for thinking she might be wrong. It's clear that she was clear-minded, and very often this won't do, or why, you know, laconic comments like that. I said that during her time as Prime Minister, increasingly people around Whitehall knew exactly what her position was and was likely to be. And you ask each other at a meeting, how do you think this will play at number 10? Or will we get this past Prime Minister? Because her views were clear and... and strong and helpful. One had to argue with them sometimes. Would you like to order, sir? Yes. I will have a steak. How do you like it? Oh, raw, please. And what about the vegetables? Oh, they'll have the same as me. That would be oh, absolutely... She right. certainly changed in the public perception and in the perception of the media from being this rather sort of, oh, gosh, we've got a woman Prime Minister. How cute. To eventually becoming, well, the toughest of all the people in her cabinet by far. Who wants to be my deputy? <laughs> so you think I need a deputy, do you? <laughs> it might not be such a bad idea. <laughs> 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 of course I don't need a deputy. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up! Now, if I hear any more of you saying that I'm overworking, I shall fire you all and do your jobs myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, when you look at the record, Margaret Thatcher was quite good at trimming and changing when, when the politics varied. She, she wasn't quite as um, struck on doing things her way as people like to imagine. Behind the scenes, she would always take a long time to make up her mind, to argue it out. 
almost she would test to destruction any idea that she would have. She would get people in for really argumentative sessions. She would say, well, now, you tell me. Now, what about this? What about that? Now, if I do this, is it possible that such as that would happen? Really, really hammered. Once she'd gone through that process and had come out at the end with a position that she had decided she was going to stick with, then she never wavered from it. In having a collective discussion, is that she would sum up before the discussion started, and those of us wouldn't put up with that. Uh, and you then had to learn how to, to, frankly, take her on. I think most of Margaret Thatcher's ministers are pretty scared of her, frankly. And the longer she went on, the more scared they became. Uh, those who did speak their mind outside and rather differed with her didn't last long in her cabinet. She wasn't somebody who was always seeking consensus. She, she said once famously, I may be the only one thinking a certain thing. I think it was over the matter of Europe, which has always been a problem for this country. She said, well, I, I may be the only one, but I'm right. We shall not be diverted from our course. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> The ladies not for turning. <laughs> I think Margaret Thatcher saw the country as, as very divided. And actually, she wanted to help people at the bottom get on. She wanted them to be able to buy their own homes. But she also wanted to break the power of the trade unions, who she, she saw as the, the reason why the country was in decline, making unreasonable wage demands, strikes and everything else. So she was absolutely determined to, to change Britain. There's no doubt about that. A loyal chancellor in 81, Geoffrey Howe, said, yes, we may be in a recession, but we have got to cut public spending. Now, that sounds, doesn't it, really old hat now. But then it was almost revolutionary. The idea that you cut public spending in a recession went against the typical Keynesian ideas that the way out of a recession was to spend your way to get up public, big public works programs. Some people still think that's the case. No, not a, but then that was the big issue. And, of course, she was hugely vilified at the time. The cheering began as soon as the Prime Minister set foot in one of West Yorkshire's most depressed areas. But she ignored the first group to talk to some of her younger supporters. It was perhaps ironic that while the water workers' dispute reaches a critical stage, Mrs Thatcher should be visiting a factory where they make baths. Despite the welcome here, more rehearsed opposition followed. The good news about inflation, which Mrs Thatcher talked about earlier, did not pacify some people at Calderdale. 60 firms closed and 11,000 redundancies, they claimed, since she came to power. The biggest protest was at Bingley, where demonstrators drowned out cheering party workers. After responding to at least one friendly wave, the Prime Minister went in and narrowly missed being splattered by a flower bomb which hit her car. Police couldn't find out who threw it. There began to be little stories coming out that the Queen was not at all happy uh, about the way things were going. Margaret Thatcher was quite nervous of the Queen, particularly at first. She was also very anxious about getting it right. I know from Margaret Thatcher's chauffeur that when she would go to have an audience with the Queen at Windsor, they would leave Downing Street so early they had to park in a lay-by near Windsor Castle, often for half an hour, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour, so they could arrive on time. So apprehensive was Margaret Thatcher of getting it right. The Queen, well, it's another Prime Minister. She takes an interest in all that's going on. It's business as usual. So I think the Queen was quite comfortable with Margaret Thatcher, but Margaret Thatcher, I think, was quite conscious that this was the Queen enough little tidbits have uh, come out about it and I think there was one version of it which says um, both sides are pretty fearful ahead of these meetings but I don't think it was Margaret Thatcher who was the fearful one. It has always been traditional that at the meetings between the Queen and the Prime Minister of the day that the Prime Minister of the day does most of the talking, the Queen does most of the listening. I would imagine that in Margaret Thatcher's time, in fact, I'm pretty sure this is true, uh, even more of the talking 
was done by the Prime Minister of the day, and even uh, more of the listening had to be done by the Queen. It's always said that Margaret Thatcher used to go into those audiences of the Queen and curtsy lower in front of the Queen than any other person ever curtsied before her. It was all done with great curtsy before, and I think the, the Queen doesn't like that. She doesn't, and she wants it to be straightforward and, and honest. And I don't think they ever really hit it off, to be very honest with you. There is no evidence of this whatsoever. The Queen, I know, would simply not talk about it. Certainly wouldn't talk about it to anybody outside her immediate family. So the Queen, I think, would have been interested to find here is a woman Prime Minister, and I think would have uh, found appealing Margaret Thatcher's go-getting approach to life. And the Queen, though she is above party politics, I think genuinely, is a naturally conservative person with a small c, so that she would have been in sympathy with quite a few of Margaret Thatcher's ideas. As to what she thought about Margaret Thatcher, you can look at the following things. The moment that she left office, she gave her the Order of Merit, and a few years later she gave her the Order of the Garter. These are two very, very senior, rather different honours. Both of them are in the personal gift of the Queen. And that tells you everything you need to know about what she thought about Margaret Thatcher. Great respect for her. The Falklands War was, if you like, another example of the way Mrs. Thatcher would approach uh, something with basic ideas. You did not allow any other country to invade your country or even the furthest flung bit of your country with impunity. She was not going to have it. Whatever the rights and wrongs of it, she was not going to have it. When the decision was taken to send the task force, for example, there were plenty of voices, and I suspect from the uh, Minister of Defence himself, uh, that really this couldn't be done by this, this was a much bigger operation. But again, that Margaret Thatcher idea of just get on with it, just get on with it. What I was told was that the moment that she decided to do it, she cut through all the orders in council, all the red tape and everything. She got all those troops out there as fast as possible. She was incredibly efficient. And if you remember, things were done, like the fitting of the air-to-air -air refueling uh, mechanisms on the tankers uh, so that planes could get down to the Falklands and return without having to um, land, and uh, the fitting out of the QE2, as a support ship and all the other things that had to go with it. And people, I think, still say that nothing like it really has been achieved um, uh, since then. So this was yet another example. Once Margaret Thatcher had made up her mind that there was one course that she was going to follow, she absolutely followed it through and was absolutely determined to follow it through right to the end. Beforehand, there were quite a lot of difficulties going on, and there always are with Prime Ministers domestically, because they're always trying to tackle the impossible, like the health service and all these things. For how much money you put into the health service, you're always going to have a problem with it. And of course, this was a sort of tremendous sort of um, morale boost to Britain and for her, and she sailed through. The commander of the operation has sent the following message. Be pleased to inform Her Majesty that the White Ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. God save the Queen. What happens next? What's the nonsense? Thank you very much. What's your reaction? Just rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Are we going Good night. People like a leader. People like to be led from the front. And at times of war, people like a strong leader. David Lloyd George in the First World War in this country, Winston Churchill in the Second World War, Margaret Thatcher was seen to lead this country effectively at the time of the Falklands conflict. People like a strong war leader. Indeed, if you look back on the Prime Ministers of the United Kingdom that people remember, they usually are war leaders. It has been said that we surprised the world, that British patriotism was rediscovered in those spring days. Mr. President, 
It was never really lost. I think it meant that the 1983 result was a certainty. But she herself didn't see it like that. She had to be dragged into the 1983 election. As you know, they're five-year terms. This was going to be a four-year term. And she wanted very, very good reason indeed as to why she should go to the country after four years. And she had to be convinced of the political scene in the United Kingdom uh, that um, th this was going to lead to victory. In the end, the combination of an incredibly ineffective opposition and the fact that she'd won this military victory meant that uh, she got her biggest ever majority in the 1983 election. A large uh, victory, as it looks now, than I, than I had ever dared to hope, because I am so fortunate. I think she was very quite fortunate that the man who was um, deployed twice a week to stand up against her parliamentary question, Prime Minister's questions, was Neil Kinnock, because you did sometimes feel that he was like a puppy um, instructed to go out there and sort of jump up and say something that he probably didn't really feel terribly strongly about, and she was quite able, quite efficiently, to slap him down on a re very regular basis. I mean, she didn't have a very strong opponent, it has to be said. Finally, Prime Minister, uh, if there's one thing you will want this next administration to be remembered for, what would it be? I think for having clear policies with a purpose and for steadfastly carrying them out and for being stalwart for freedom and justice. The big clash of Margaret Thatcher's uh, premiership came with the miners. The coal mining industry in this country was in decline anyway, but there were still an awful lot of pits. Uh, and mine workers tended to be very militant people, led by a very militant man, Arthur Scargill. Uh, and he decided that they should strike to try to prevent more closures of various pits. But it was an absolutely epic battle between Margaret Thatcher's vision of Britain, where everybody would have a chance and so on, but they would not be relying on the trade unions to push themselves along, and Arthur Scargill's view that working people, traditional industries needed protecting, the common man uh, would be crushed by the political machine. It was a battle like that. This year, as before in our history, we've seen men and women with brave hearts, defying violence, scorning intimidation, and defending their rights to uphold our laws. Yeah. By their action, we have seen a new birth of leadership in Britain, and that is the most important thing the most enduring thing that is going to come out of this coal strike, a new birth of leadership. Quietly at the start, she let things take their course, but was determined to see that Mr Scargill was going to be defeated. I think that Margaret Thatcher and the Conservative cabinet post-83 knew that there was going to be a confrontation with the miners sooner rather than later. And in fact, there's plenty of evidence that they had been thinking about it for some time and had already been preparing for the eventuality of this happening. And so, quietly, they began to do things like stockpiling coal. And the National Coal Board was told to build up the stocks. Officially, it was all down to the National Coal Board and the miners. It's not for the government to say how these things should happen. It's for Mr McGregor, chairman of the Coal Board. Actually, it wasn't like that. We now know, of course, it wasn't like that. She wanted this sorted out once and for all. It is intimidation. It is unlawful assembly. Our duty demands and the national interest requires that we see that violence does not pay and is seen not to pay.
remember there'd been a particularly dreadful incident towards the end of the miners' strike when the striking miners had tossed some concrete off a road bridge into, I think, probably some people who were trying either to go to a picket line or trying to break a picket line, I'm not sure which. And she was in Paris that day, and I was on duty, and I caught her on the steps of the Elysee Palace, and I said to her, Prime Minister, someone has now been killed. Isn't it now time, at long last, to open up negotiations and to try and get a negotiated settlement? And her eyes literally blazed at me, and she swept round and said to me, said, Mr. Brunson, you never give in to violence. Turn on a heel, walked away. <laughs> You talk about the ruthless, manipulating few. Now, will you not negotiate with them ever? I will never negotiate with people who use coercion and violence to achieve their objective. They are the enemies of democracy. They are not interested in the future of democracy. They are trying to kill democracy for their own purposes. Outside, several eggs were thrown. One hit the prime minister, though a detective's sleeve caught the worst of it and a special branch umbrella went up to deflect others. It was, for her, the most important uh, test of her leadership. Uh, and in the end, frankly, she won. We have almost no coal industry left. Uh, Mr Scargill is long retired. Uh, the power of the trade unions, particularly the mining unions, power is gone. Last destroyed rooms on three floors of the building where the Prime Minister, her cabinet, and dozens of MPs were staying. Alongside the lifesavers, a bomb disposal officer was making his own search for clues to the bomber's identity. The first body was brought out of the building. The Prime Minister went to Brighton Police Station to tell newsmen about her own escape. She was awake and had just completed work on her conference speech when the bomb went off. My husband was in bed and all the windows went and the bathroom was extremely badly damaged. In your own room? Yes, oh, yes. We were, lucky enough, yeah. we, were, we were very lucky. You hear about these atrocities, these bombs, you don't expect them to happen to you. But. Life must go on as usual. And your conference Thank will you go on. Thank the conference you. will go on. Thank you. The conference, all right, all right, John. The yeah. conference will go on as usual. Thank you. The sun was just coming through the stained glass windows and falling on some flowers right across the church. And it just occurred to me that this was the day I was meant not to see. We are fighting as we have always fought, for the weak as well as for the strong. We are fighting for great and good causes. We are fighting to defend them against the power and might of those who rise up to challenge them. This government will not weaken. This nation will meet that challenge. Democracy will prevail. Mrs. Thatcher was very good at was somehow sort of keeping Britain in, 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 the, in the middle of the picture. When Russian leaders and American leaders were going to meet, they, they, they always seemed to sort of come via Britain and somehow Mrs. Thatcher was always sort of there. very good relationship that she had with Ronald Reagan and I, I think one mustn't underestimate you know her femininity and how she could appeal to a sort of uh, you know jaunty old Hollywood actor turned prime minister and how she could uh, flatter him and and I mean, she's very very good at all that there is no greater alliance in the world than the Anglo-American alliance and if it goes through periodic small difficulties as it did in my time over Grenada those will not last long it will come back into its full alliance and its full defense of democracy and freedom the world over. 
Margaret Thatcher was the right woman in the right place at the right time. And she became a symbolic figure. She, together with Ronald Reagan, became the two world leaders associated with the end of communism, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall. That will be, in a sense, her legacy. Now, how much she actually did personally to bring that about, I'm not entirely sure. That may simply have been the tide of history. But she was there making the right noises at the right time, and she was blessed by having somebody in America with whom she had a true fellow feeling. They were friends, they were kindred spirits, and so it was a partnership that really worked. Gorbachev, of course, was a reformer. He knew what he wanted to do, and he obviously saw that she was a woman who knew what she wanted to do, and I think that's where uh, that affinity came from, because she wanted to move things forward in relations with the Soviet Union, so did he, and so that's where that came from. She got on very badly uh, with the leaders in Europe. Um, she had a deep, deep distrust of the Germans, and that was a historical thing, because people perhaps forget that someone who had come through, and of course, she knew for herself, she'd seen the effects of World War II for herself, and so the residual dislike, to put it mildly, uh, of the Germans and what they stood for was, was within her, and so she was immediately suspicious of German ideas. And of course, the French were sort of beyond the pale. <laughs> anyway, she didn't really get on with the French either. <laughs> Mr. Blair says he wants to lead in Europe. But the price of that is that he's expected to lead Britain by the nose into the single currency. And he's prepared to do it. I would never be prepared to give up our own currency. to be entrusted with the government of this country, this great country, once again. And I want to say this to you. The greater the trust, the greater the duty upon us to be worthy of that trust. And we will indeed endeavor to serve the people of these islands in the future as we have in the past. By the time we came to the 87 election, the minor strike, of course, was in people's memories, but. You know, so many other issues had, had begun to come in and again. There was, you know, more economic problems to deal with. Um, she'd been in office then, you know, obviously a long time. And I think people then sort of had to look at her in the round when they made their decision in 87. And, of course, she got a lower majority. So that, if you like, the sort of doubts as to whether she's always going to be right, um, we're beginning to see then, I think. And could you clear up what the position is about your own future? Do you intend to fight the next election? Look, we've just won this one. We've won it very well. It will be four or five years to the next election. No one can predict precisely what will happen during that time. Let us get on with the programme that we were elected to introduce. There's a great deal of work to do. Margaret, this time you've just gone too far. You've turned into a dictator. <clears throat> You don't listen to anyone. You're insane, Margaret. You've lost all reason. We've had enough. You're finished. Yes, 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 yes. Hmm. All right. Has everyone got their lines? Yes, yes, yes I've right. got my right. We're all ready. Right. No pulling out now. No. We've gone this far. There's no backing down. Yes. Right. 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 Morning. Go on. Uh, Margaret. Yes, Geoffrey. Uh, Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Right. Good morning, sir. Stand up. Sit down. Stick your finger up your nose. And make a noise like a chicken. You spineless insects. I despise you. Oh, thank you, sir. Towards the end of her time, uh, she did become noticeably more authoritarian. Where you did really begin to notice it was post-87 when, in a way, she got carried away with her own power, the feeling by then that nothing really happened unless she did it and forced it through and everybody had to do what she said. 
Mrs Thatcher appeared on the steps of Downing Street with her husband this morning, breaking off preparations for tomorrow's visit to Kenya and Nigeria in order to officially mark her record eight years and 244 days in number 10. That rain began in May 1979 with much the same wave. Today she said the time had gone quickly, there was still much to do. We have achieved quite a lot. When I went through that door, Britain was known for suffering from the British disease. Now we're known for having the British cure and people come to us, a newly confident country, to see exactly how we've done it. One of the few critical notes has come from Sir John Knott, her former Defence Secretary, who reportedly told the BBC's Panorama that Mrs Thatcher sometimes had to be restrained from going over the top. I have no idea what John Knott has said. John Knott was a very vivid, vital, uh, interesting member of our cabinet, full of new ideas. He said your leadership was over the top, Mrs Thatcher. <laughs> right. Tonight, Sir John told ITN Mrs Thatcher had been an outstanding Prime Minister, her achievements immense. She'd out-survived all the ministers who'd been with her at the very beginning, almost all the senior advisers and civil servants. So towards the end, she did become, mm, well, um, pretty difficult to certainly control. No one could control her. The very interesting thing about successful politicians, or perhaps anyone who's successful in public life, is that what um, makes them really successful at the beginning is also what, to some extent, later on brings them down. And her great success, of course, was not listening to those silly ministers and, you know, using what, doing what she wanted to do and driving things ahead and being sort of very, very forceful. So eventually, of course, that's, that's perhaps what, what did for her. I remember talking after she left office, for example, some years after she left office, to Kenneth Clark, who had served in her, her cabinet. And he said it was absolutely astonishing. We would have cabinet committee meetings and we would all have a fair idea of what was uh, being discussed and what decisions appear to have been reached. And the following morning, the minutes of the cabinet committee would come round and there were completely different conclusions. And of course, we'd had a foreshadowing of that in, in the Westland affair with Michael Hesertine. That was his complaint, uh, that uh, business wasn't being conducted uh, properly. In the early days, before going to a European summit meeting, for example, she would have a gathering of all the ministers whose agenda was likely to be discussed and senior civil servants. And her briefing would be thorough and comprehensive. In the later days, on issues that were familiar, she was almost unwilling to discuss at all. That's why Nigel Lawson and I fell out with her and she wouldn't have a meeting with us before the Madrid summit. It had become more distant and less easy to, to handle. There was a very, very a, a serious difference there. Basically, uh, it was the argument that ran through uh, the whole of her time as Prime Minister as to the attitudes to Europe. Lawson increasingly felt that we had to get close to something like monetary union. And her particular hatred of what he was doing was that he was trying to get the pound to shadow the Deutsche Mark which he thought was highly suspicious. And so Alan Walters, who she appointed as her private financial affairs economic advisor, was telling her that. He was telling her on a daily basis that what Lawson was doing was wrong. And in the end, of course, Lawson could take no more of it and went. And you know, Prime Minister who loses a Chancellor is obviously in some trouble. Nigel's position, as I said to him, is unassailable. He was a very strong man. Just now, is it? He's gone. That is his choice. I tried to persuade him to stay. I couldn't believe that he would go when he's been such a strong chancellor, and his position was unassailable. Do you deny that Nigel would have stayed if you had sacked Professor Armaldus? I don't know. Well, but that's a terrible I admission, Prime Minister. For... I you, don't know. Of course you don't, I don't know. know. You, you could have kept your chancellor, possibly, if you had sacked your part-time advisor. I wanted to keep my Chancellor in any event because he was very good, his position was unassailable and let's face it, Brian, he was Chancellor. For the Prime Minister, business as usual meant church as usual near Chequers today. She'll have been aware that her interview this afternoon would be watched anxiously by Tory backbenchers, many of whom have called for a softer leadership style following the resignation crisis. I'm staying my own sweet, reasonable self, founded on very strong convictions. Prime Minister, Britain, I must, I must stop you no, there. No, you thank, must not. Thank you very, I must. Thank you very much strong indeed. Strong leadership will continue.
it simply has to be a change of style. And if she's not prepared to change her style, then I think we've got to face up to the position of whether we can continue with her as leader. It was part of this mix that was all going on. The idea of the poll tax going to be rolled out, uh, the arguments over Europe, um, the approaching recession. There were signs, of course, that we were going to go back into another recession. Um, it was just all beginning to go wrong. Mr Baker confirmed that the backbenchers had asked the Prime Minister to get her act together. Yes, they certainly said that, and I think that that's very important. Um, the government has appeared from time to time to be disunited. It's very important that we uh, present the whole of government policy as a united uh, series of policies drawn from collective responsibility. And when told, and please get your act together, what was the Prime Minister's reply? Well, the Prime Minister listened a great deal. Uh, which is, again, very important. It was the opportunity to do that. If, if you're help. asking her to stop being a strong leader, then I don't think that would be the position. And word came from the Thatcher camp later that there would be no softening of the Prime Minister's style, that she was, quote, the true guardian of the government's purpose. Among Conservative MPs today, divided opinions about what's happened. One camp thinks that Mrs Thatcher has emerged the stronger from all that's happened, now that the simmering row between her and Nigel Lawson has come to an end. But another camp feels that she has been seriously weakened. Past her sell-by date is the way one backbench AMP put it today. And there's also continuing talk about making a formal challenge to her leadership. They thought their winner had become a loser. And at that time, the election of the leader of the party was entirely in the gift of members of parliament. And they were fearful that they, as individuals, would not be re-elected or stood a better chance of being re-elected with a new leader. Also, after you've been in power for a number of years, uh, people, well, you've promoted those who are going to be promoted, and those who haven't been promoted know they never will be. So the leader has no longer got any patronage to offer. So you can't say, I'm going to look after you, because you haven't looked after them so far. So you've got these three or four hundred people milling around Westminster, knowing they're not going to be advanced any further, because they haven't been so far, thinking they're going to lose their seats. They turn on the leader. Mrs Thatcher herself speaking in Downing Street tonight was very well satisfied with the result. I'd like to say how very pleased I am with this result. And very pleased I am to have the overwhelming support of my colleagues in the House and of people from the party in the country. Prime Ministers have a lot of work to do. There's a great pile of it inside. And I think it would be better now if I left you and went to get on with it. Thank you. She did become noticeably more authoritarian. Where you saw the change most of all was in the introduction of what she to the very last insisted on calling the community charge and the rest of the country called the poll tax. And this was her downfall because enough people told her that the country would not accept what was widely seen as an unfair tax. All they knew was there was ho this horrible, nasty tax, which for a lot of people meant that the amount they were paying was going up and that she had brought it in. And so far from blaming the local councils, they blamed her. And she then became completely entrenched about it. It is our intention, when the community charge is finally set, to say precisely what the increase would have been in domestic rates had that taken the place of the community charge. People are not going to pay what might have been. They are going to pay the much higher charges inflicted upon them by her and her government. In a way, I think that was her biggest mistake because she didn't listen to people. People were beginning to tell her, you can't go with the poll tax. But by then, she was getting impatient, and she decided to ignore people's advice. And then she really did go ahead and look what happened as a result. spoke yesterday of Mr Kinnock's weasel words over responsibility for previous violence today. She expressed her absolute horror at the rioting. Nothing but nothing that warrants this. The place to discuss these matters is Parliament. These people 
are totally against democracy. The person in the end who delivered the coup de grace was Geoffrey Howe. And this was over the issue of Europe. It was to do with a plan that the then president of the European Commission, Jacques Delors, had put forward. And, and there were three points on it. And she dealt with these three points and she set them out to the House of Commons. And then she said, I can't remember quite the precise words, but the three words that mattered were her response to it, no, no, no. And thereupon, Geoffrey Howe, above all, decided that was it. He seemed such a mild man, a nice man, really, which he was, but he came to disagree with her very violently. Eventually, she replaced him as Chancellor, but he then stood up in the House of Commons and made a speech which was the first direct attack on her leadership. And I think it was stunning because anybody dared to do it. But the fact that it was Geoffrey Howe, of all people, it had all the more impact. The tragedy is, and it is for me personally, for my party, for our whole people, and for my right honourable friend herself, a very real tragedy. If the Prime Minister's perceived attitude towards Europe is running increasingly serious risks for the future of our nation. It risks minimising our influence and maximising our chances of being once again shut out. It's rather like sending your opening batsmen to the crease, only for them to find the moment the first balls are bowled that their bats have been broken before the game by the team captain. <laughs> Well, it wasn't my intention. My intention was to try and make the warning quite clear that the policy that was being followed uh, from her part rather than in line with what we tried to agree wasn't likely to be the right one. And I, I wasn't setting out to change the structure. But don't forget there were many other factors by then. The poll tax particularly had alienated many of our backbenchers from supporting her. And they all came together what happened. I'd been brought up in a rather conventional middle-class way so to defer to ladies. You couldn't defer to Mrs Thatcher and survive. We've got to have a rethink of the community of charge. Michael has promised that. The other good thing about Michael is that his track record in my constituency in Tavistock, where he was the former member of parliament, shows that his keynote quality is that he listens. I was told the results immediately, I said, but this means a second ballot. So we had not, in fact, got enough, but then it seemed, it did not seem to me at that stage it would be difficult uh, to get uh, three or four more people to vote with us on the second ballot. And um, although it was uh, not very easy to go to a second ballot, it didn't seem to me to be very difficult. I most earnestly believe that I shall be in number 10 Downing Street at the end of this week, and a little bit longer than that. The last few weeks of the Thatcher tie were absolutely astonishing. From the feeling that Margaret Thatcher would almost never be removed from office, uh, suddenly, you know, it was like watching a sandcastle, and the waves suddenly lashed up against the sandcastle, and the sandcastle suddenly went like that. Something happened while I was away that night. There were various meetings all over the place. I think uh, in London, I couldn't obviously be here. And when I got back the, the next morning, it still seemed to me that I would have a good chance. But during the day, uh, I got on with starting to get the confidence motion ready. And then thought I simply must see uh, the cabinet and some other people. And it was just very strange. Have you seen a situation slip away from you? I'm a politician. I know I can feel it. I can sense it. And when... Um, some people whom I expected to be absolutely uh, staunch um, uh, had very different views, said, look, I will support you, but I don't think that, um, that it is a foregone conclusion, uh, then, all right, no general can fight without a really good army behind. We know, really, that it was Dennis Thatcher who was uh, at his feet very firmly on the ground, who, again, rather like Prince Philip and the Queen, was a very good advisor of her. I mean, he, um, 
you know, he could say when things worked and didn't work, and he just said, well, it's time to go, the game is up, you know, and that's when she stepped aside. Ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years, and we're very happy that we leave the United Kingdom in a very, very much better state than when we came here 11 and a half years ago. You don't take a decision like that without it being difficult, without heartbreak. Heartbreak there may have been, but it was the right decision. I think that uh, most of the ministers who kind of gave their advice were not people who were going to start voting the other way or abstaining. I think what they were saying was, look, you know, we've been loyal to you, we're friends of yours, we think this is all ghastly, but we do have to tell you, we don't think you're going to win, and in those circumstances, um, we think that you should stand down. What we do not want to see is you being humiliated uh, by being uh, defeated. What went wrong was that we did not get a big enough majority on the first ballot. And there's nothing I could do to cure that. That was the thing I couldn't get over. They said to me as I went through it, but you haven't been to ask us to vote for you. Other people have. And I thought, goodness me, do I, after 11 and a half years, have to go and ask personally for a vote? I remember previous leadership elections, but there you are. Uh, they, they thought that I did, and I thought that um, that was not necessarily the right way to do it. I think it was a whole bringing together of all kinds of emotions. She could not understand how never having lost an election and never having lost a major vote in the House of Commons that this could ever have happened to her. She just, in a sense, in the modern phrase, didn't get it. By the time you've been a Prime Minister, say, for 11 and a half years, I think doing the things which I had managed to do, I felt that one should have more authority and backing from one's own party than I had if I hadn't. Right, we needed a change. It really was as, as, as clear-cut as that. I think that, yes, those interviews were interesting, not least because when I got her to recall the events of those final ten days or so, she burst into tears again in the middle of the interview. And we had to stop it and uh, let her just go and refix her makeup. Yes, it um, was seared into her soul. That, though, the image that people will perhaps remember, she said the cabinet was extremely difficult. And then you had to come out into Downing Street and you had to face the cameras. Mm -hmm. In effect, you had to face the world. Mm -hmm. You had to come and make what was perhaps the statement of your life. And then mm -hmm. I see that, you know, we notice now that it's affecting you now, and it must have been yes, the most Yes, it's not affecting difficult. my voice now. It's not affecting my voice. You're thinking back to traumatic things. Um, but I managed to get through them. I managed to get through the television. I managed to get through the cabinet. Again, because there was something else to do. She thought that she had left the country in a better state than she had found it. And to a degree, she was right. But so many other things, and above all, the poll tax, had turned the country effectively against her. But she couldn't see that. You'll have heard it a million times. People said that she probably never had a happy day in her life after she left 10 Downing Street. You know, because that was what it was all about. I hope in the next few years to build on those achievements. I certainly hope in those years to build a society of opportunity. By that I mean an open society, a society in which what people fulfill will depend upon their talent, their application and their good fortune. She had uh, promised that John Major would have her support and famously of course she said, and I paraphrase, John Major's the driver, but don't forget I'm a very good backseat driver. And that did a lot of harm because she thought that Major wasn't coming down sufficiently hard on one side or other of the uh, European debate, and of course she would have wanted him to be an out and out skeptic. And um, she uh, was disappointed. Yes, I will have very strong views on both Europe and on Bosnia. 
I always did, and you know that. I also have very strong views in supporting the Prime Minister. He's out of the ERM. Uh, he rejected the, the social charter. So Granny will speak out? I can't imagine Granny not speaking out if she feels very strongly about something. There are enough opposition politicians and media commentators rocking the boat. We do not expect the elders of our own party to join this unhelpful cause. It's the role Lady Thatcher has made her own. Today, centre stage at the annual conference, the party faithful cheering as they do for no other former leader. But it was behind the scenes that the Iron Lady showed the metal for which she became famous, telling a British Airways official in the exhibition hall they should not have replaced the Union flag on their aircraft tails with new multicoloured logos. Husband Dennis demanded to know why they weren't British design. We had British design. Well, we had. Then, reaching into her famous handbag, <laughs> Lady Thatcher left British Airways in no doubt about her view of the new design. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher is not a person with a great sense of humour, and she's not a person wildly interested in show business. Uh, in fact, I think she's fairly ignorant of show business. I don't think going to the cinema really is part and parcel of her way of life. But nor is she a vain person. She'd have been intrigued by the idea of a movie being made of her and would probably be uh, impressed by Meryl Streep's performance. There have already been, um, you know, in the last couple of years, dramatic versions of her life and a huge amount of commentary. And this is just one version of the story. It's a story of what it might have felt like to take on, you know, be literally a, a, a sort of lone woman in a sea of men. It's what it might have felt like to um, have to struggle to gain control, first of her party, um, let alone of the country. And it's very much about the, the private cost of a huge public life. This is one imagining of how it might have felt to be her. I think she was conscious of her place in history, conscious that she was there, not just making a noise, but making a difference in the world. And yet she wasn't personally vainglorious. She was aware of what she had achieved and that it was remarkable and good. Quite a long time after uh, Margaret Thatcher, Lady Thatcher as she became, left office at number 10, I had to go and interview her uh, at her new office, which was round the corner, not very far from Parliament, and it was as if she was still in power. Uh, there were police guards on the door, and there were lots of people scurrying about, and I was taken into her office, very big uh, office indeed, a big desk, lots of pictures on the wall, lots of items on the desk itself. And I was very struck that the theme of almost all of them was the Falklands War. Oh, I think she's going to be very high up in the list of great British prime ministers. I suppose we must always give the accolade to Churchill because winning the Second World War, he is a sort of a magnificent figure. I'd be jolly tempted to put her next to him, frankly. I mean, to be a woman, to do that, to achieve what she did, and to stay in office as long as she did, um, as the first woman ever to take that office at a time when it was very, very difficult, I think that's pretty impressive. There are those who see the Thatcher years as the best years since the Second World War, at a time when Britain's influence in the world came back, we dealt with a lot of our problems, we changed society for the better. A lot of people think that. They tend to be people who've done well, who've um, made more money and have uh, nice houses and so forth. The, the, the more privileged people, I think, have done pretty well. A lot of people, on the other hand, who are more humble origins, regret very much the Thatcher years. They think she did damage to the country, and it absolutely depends on how well you did in that period as to what you think of Margaret Thatcher. I think her impact was enormous. I think she just changed the way that political business was done. The idea, as it were, that we could do everything with a sort of warm, cosy consensus 
I think that went forever, and I don't think, actually, it has ever come back. The one thing to remember about Margaret Thatcher is that politics and power are to her everything. That's really the passion of her life. That's what drove her. If we were to fail, that freedom could be imperiled. So let us resist the blandishments of the faint hearts. Let us ignore the howls and threats of the extremists. Let us stand together and do our duty, and we shall not fail.